Good afternoon, everyone. This is Joe Bacella here at Chaken Analytics, and I'd like to welcome you to our presentation of the Path to Profits, two experts on money on making money in today's market. Presenting today is Mark Chaken, founder and CEO of Chaken Analytics, who is known for developing the Chaken Power Gauge rating. Presenting along with Mark is Nick Webb, Executive Vice President at Chaken Analytics. Nick has spent nearly 30 years in the financial services industry and has worked with over 70% of the top investment management firms in the United States. Now, throughout our presentation, please submit your questions using the Zoom Q&A window, which you can access in the upper left-hand corner of your screen. As a reminder, this webinar is being recorded and a copy will be sent to everyone who has registered. Now to get us started, here's Mark Chaikin. Thank you, Joe, and welcome, everybody. In this afternoon's webinar, we're going to look at two very distinct uh, methodologies, bottom-up stock picking using our proprietary uh, four-factor, 20-sub-factor quantitative model, and a top-down approach to sectors and industry groups, which will zero in on ETFs and select industry groups and stocks within them. So um, two uh, approaches that the institutional investor uses. Uh, Nick will give you a little color on that. Uh, but to get us started, a little bit of background. I've been on Wall Street for over 50 years. Uh, for 45 years, I've been using technical analysis along with fundamentals. So with individual clients, because I was Series 7 registered in 1966, and then when we were working with institutional uh, clients, how important it was to use technical analysis in conjunction with fundamentals, particularly in a bear market. And we're gonna start out the webinar by looking at the current state of the market. A lot of headlines on CNBC about how a bear market's just around the corner. We're gonna um, address that and refute that. Along the way, I've headed the options department at Tucker Anthony and RL Day, great regional firm. So if any of you are advisors who use options, although we're not talking about that in today's webinar, we're, um, sponsoring a series of three options webinars, beginning, intermediate, and advanced, and um, be happy to have you join us for those. And most importantly on this bio, along the way, I've been mentored by some of the smartest and most successful institutional investors. Some of them were colleagues, others were clients. The reason this is important is that when I created the Chaikin Power Gauge rating in 2010, I drew upon everything I had learned from my mentors and my clients to create a, a quantitative model that reflects how Wall Street investors who've been successful look at the market. And it's really the culmination of my life's work, and we'll get into that after we set the table with some market analysis. I'd like to welcome my colleague, Nick Webb, who joined us in January and give him the floor to uh, give you a little bit of his background. Well, thanks, Mark. So not quite 50 years in financial services, but I've been in financial services for over 30 years, everything from economic consulting to equity research. And finally, I've uh, spent 19 years at Thomson Reuters, including five at a firm called Baseline, where I had the pleasure of traveling around the country and meeting with most of the institutional investors um, in the country. Um, you know, working with them and, you know, like Mark, I, I picked up an awful lot from the people that I've interacted with over the years. And I've really had uh, just the pleasure of working with, you know, whether it's incredible investment houses like uh, Wellington, and Fidelity and Janus, uh, all the way down to some of these small shops where they really have a very focused investment technique. And working with these people, you, you pick up all the, to hopefully most of the tools of the trade. Uh, and, and like Mark, hopefully we can share some of that uh, during the, the course of this presentation. So uh, thank you, Nick. Mark. And um, sort of give you a little, uh, background on who's been looking at Chaikin. Uh, since we launched Chaikin Analytics and introduced our first product in January 2011, uh, a number of the media outlets like CNBC and Barron's have written us up. We've just been featured in the current issue of Forbes where they're talking about the Mexican economy and uh, I developed a strategy based on the 10 largest holdings in the EWW, which is the Mexican ETF. 
uh, were also now being um, used by firms like Paulson, Hedge Funds, Soros, and Fidelity. So a lot of uh, validation for what we've been doing here at Chaikin and our power gauge rating and the culmination of that for the 26 people here in Philadelphia who work so hard on uh, behalf of our clients and developing new products and educating them is the award we got from Benziga, which is a news uh, and information organization in Detroit, uh, which sponsors FinTech awards every year. And we were fortunate enough to win the Benziga FinTech award for best ideas platform. And that's really what we're gonna be sharing with you today, our best ideas for how you can guide your clients assets into the most productive uh, vehicles, whether you're building portfolios with ETFs or doing bottom up stock picking. And by the way, um, our experience is that 50% of advisors are still using individual stocks, even if they're using exchange traded funds. Now, give us a feel for whether you use individual stocks by typing a big S into the um, Q and A chat window, please, because it'll help us uh, in creating future webinars, also in guiding our product development. So if you if you use individual stocks in uh, client portfolios, please type a big S into the question box. And Joe, could you pipe in and tell me how many S's you're seeing there, please? Well, Joe may come on a little later. Well, no, it looks like we're uh, well over uh, 15 S's so far, so. Okay, so this Good sort morning. of validates uh, what we've heard that um, advisors are not shunning stocks, but they are focusing on ETFs. So in the next 45 minutes, we're gonna show you how to position your portfolios for profits. Uh, it's important to know what to expect in the months ahead. Obviously very important to zero in on winning sectors, industry groups, and stocks. Equally as important to avoid the losers. So we're gonna go through a whole bear market scenario um, focusing on the energy sector. Uh, we're gonna show you how to build a portfolio uh, using a disciplined approach to both ETFs and stock selection, and then uh, how to find use ETFs to find the strongest and weakest stocks uh, in the strongest and weakest ETFs. Now, I'd like to start out with a question. Do you think that political turmoil or excess valuations will result in a bear market? Because we read a lot in the press about how valuations are stretched and that means the market is vulnerable. And we're also hearing a lot of people who are concerned about the turmoil in Washington around the Russian investigation and possible obstruction of justice affecting the Trump agenda and so forth. So. The reality is, if you've been concerned about the political turmoil in Washington, it's important to know that in the past, unsettling political events over the last 50 years have not caused bear markets. I'll zero in on two of them. In 1963, President John F. Kennedy was assassinated. Believe it or not, the bull market resumed two days later. That's how... Um, pragmatic Wall Street can be. Sad times for the country and for the Kennedy family, but the bull market continued on. And then in 1998, uh, when the Star Commission uh, was convened and articles of impeachment were drawn up against then President William Clinton, Bill Clinton, uh, the bull market continued for another two years. So political events, unsettling political events, have not in the past 50 years caused bear markets. Now what does precede a bear market are downturns in some key economic indicators which lead to a recession. So I've highlighted two of them. There are about three or four that are extremely reliable. An inverted yield curve is one of them. You're also, if you watch CNBC, hearing about the inverted yield curve or you read Barron's, the yield curve is flattening out, but it hasn't inverted yet. Actually, a flat yield curve in the past that doesn't invert or go to below zero has been very bullish for the market three to six months later. So we're setting up for a big rally, in our opinion, eventually going to break through 2450. But here are two 
economic indicators that have turned down ahead of every recession since 1960. 12 month moving average of housing starts. Now, last week, there was a lot of bad news in the housing sector. Housing starts, sentiment of home builders and so forth, very bad, three months in a row of declining numbers. But yet the 12 month moving average is still rising. And in fact, the home builder ETF and some key home middle east stocks that we've zeroed in on, like KB Homes, KBH, have actually made new highs as recently as this morning. So this indicator, which has reliably turned down ahead of every recession in the last almost 60 years, is still rising. And then the ratio of leading to coincident indicators has also been a very, very reliable precursor of recessions. And of course, why is a recession important? Because most bear markets in the stock market in our lifetime going back to post-World War II have been accompanied by a recession. So, yeah, and Mark, if I can, uh, the thing with housing starts is even though it's been recent troubled news, the absolute fundamentals of housing starts really still seem in place. The interest rates are low, uh, but probably more important, uh, employment is, is nearing full, full employment and the millennials are finally getting enough money to begin to move out of their houses, so, or out of their parents' houses. So housing starts, while it might have a little bit of a rocky period, the fundamentals are in place for that to continue to go strong for quite some time. Oh, that's true. They're actually moving out of their parents' basements. We get a, <laughs> we get a laugh on that, but it's true. Uh, so if political turmoil is not going to really create a bear market and economic uh, indicators that predict a recession haven't yet turned down, uh, where are we in the stock market? Well, I'm calling this a Yogi Berra market. It ain't over till it's over. We're in an earnings-driven bull market. Now, the original impetus for the bull market that began in March of 2009 was the Fed stimulating the economy through quantitative easing, buying bonds, lowering interest rates. But for the last two years, we really haven't had the benefit of the Fed. In fact, they're raising interest rates and dialing back their balance sheet. But what we have had is a big turnaround in corporate earnings and also revenues. In the last quarter, the first quarter, uh, and now the second quarter, revenues are beating expectations. So what's important is the direction of the market because technical analysis can be your friend in a market that's unloved. And this is probably the most unloved bull market in history. Trend of corporate earnings is extremely important. The trend of interest rates is important and a little confusing here, and I'll show you why in a minute. And then sector and industry group strength, absolutely critical to having your client assets position in the right vehicles allocated appropriately. So uh, let's take a look at the scenario for 2017. And Nick, I'll let you speak to this chart because um, you actually fell in love with this courtesy of Bank America, Merrill Lynch. Right, right. Hey, what's nice about this chart is it really goes through what the likely scenarios are under falling or rising interest rates, falling or rising earnings. And you can see in the start of the bull market, we had sort of the, the most perfect of all scenarios where you had falling rates and rising earnings. And so obviously that's clearly the most bullish for stocks. You then had a situation where the, not recession, but, but slowing economy began to bite down on earnings. And so 2015, you saw the falling rates and the falling earnings. That's beginning to get a little bearish, uh, but not. it's still fine. And it's actually moving into an area that we think is even a little bit better than that, which is rates are slowly rising. And, and you know, you'll see in, shortly they're up, but long-term rates really haven't gone up dramatically. But earnings are rising. And that's actually a very, uh, it's not the most bullish scenario, but it's certainly a decent scenario for stocks. Um, I think there were a lot of eyes on the last quarter's earnings, um, and they came through with flying colors. So as long as the economy can keep generating earnings, such as the first quarter, um, I think we're in reasonably good shape. And hopefully that'll eventually bring some of the valuations down. 
So. Well, uh, also, it's important to note that in 2015, going into 16, a lot of the pundits on CNBC were predicting a bear market based on the fact that we had what was called an earnings recession, six quarters of year over year declines in earnings. But that was primarily uh, due to what was going on in the energy complex, which peaked in July, August of 2014. So, uh, my advice in our weekly market letter for the last year and a half has been avoid the headlines, ignore the headlines, and focus on what's really important, which are the trend of earnings and the technical picture for the market. So uh, let's start out with the bond market. The bond market is, to me, perplexing. And I talked to a very successful money manager yesterday um, who's worked in both the quantitative side and also in the technical side. And he's as perplexed as a lot of people on Wall Street. Now, why is that? The Fed is telling us that they're raising rates. They told us that this little dip in inflation um, is a one-time thing having to do with cellular uh, phone uh, rates coming down because of hyper competition. Uh, but in spite of the fact that the Fed is raising the Fed funds rate, the bond market is actually attracting money. And I think this is actually bullish for stocks. We've retraced part of the decline that um, peaked in bond prices in um, July of 2016, but we really haven't gotten that far. But it's a bit perplexing to a lot of people why interest rates aren't actually higher with the Fed raising rates and therefore uh, why aren't financial stocks doing better. The bottom line is, I think this is bullish for stocks for this reason. A lot of pension funds and endowments are heavily committed to bonds and less so to stocks. If the market can respond to positive earnings when they're reported in July for the second quarter, I think there's going to be a flood of money going into equities. Now, part of the reason bonds are strong is because you still have zero or negative interest rates in other parts of the world, in Europe, for instance. So the U.S. Treasury market is relatively appealing with the 10-year uh, Treasury yielding about 225 or so. Um, so there's a variety of conflicting um, messages coming from the bond market. But what's not conflicting is what we see in the stock market. Here's a one-year chart of the SPY ETF, which mirrors, as you know, the Standard & Poor's 500. It's the most actively traded instrument in the market. And it's, it's a way for institutions and individual investors to get instant equity exposure in large caps. So what's going on in the SPY? Well, in spite of all the turmoil in Washington and the bad economic indicators last week, SPY eked out a new high on Friday along with the Dow Jones. And we've seen a pattern of higher highs and higher lows accompanied by very strong check and money flow. Now, many of you know check and money flow, uh, which we introduced in 1982. It's on the Bloomberg terminal, it's on Reuters, it's on stockcharts.com. It measures institutional buying and selling. And as you can see, it was strong as we lifted off from the surprise Trump victory in November, and it's remained strong, hitting a pretty big peak yesterday. Now, why is that important? Because institutions are buying the dips. They're underinvested in the market. As I said earlier, it's the most unloved bull market in history, if you look at the sentiment surveys. And at the top of this chart, I've highlighted something that we're gonna look at in conjunction with ETFs. We call it the Chaken Power Bar. It's the number of stocks in any index or ETF or industry group that have bullish versus bearish ratings in our quantitative model called the Chaken Power Gauge. So right now, 123 stocks in the S&P 500 with bullish ratings, only 81 with bearish ratings. We've sort of overcome the dominance of those six big stocks, Facebook, Amazon, Apple, Netflix, and Alphabet or Google. And it's broadening out. Right. There are more stocks in the S&P with good potential performing on a price basis. And there's only 81 out of the whole 500 that really have a bearish rating. So as, as you say, Mark, this is a broad-based uh, 
you know, market where there's a lot of different opportunities to find reasonably good stocks still. And, and it's spreading out to the small cap sector. So small caps, which were written off about three weeks ago, have moved back up to a new high. So there's a nice dynamic going on in the market. And for that reason, we are bullish on the market. And here's um, a quote from an article in Reuters just today, uh, Global Business News, global stocks retreat as oil price slumps on. And I said, what's amazing to me about this market is the ability to make new highs where the energy sector is basically making new 52 leak lows. We're back to what was happening in 2014 and 15 into early 16. Uh, but we still see the market moving up. Eventually we'll break through that 2450 level, which is now, um, some strong resistance to uh, the rally. Uh, now that we're finished with earnings season until we get into the next earnings season in mid-July. So um, this is very current. We're, we're very clear on where we think the market's going. We've had a long-standing target of 2450 to 2500. And we might even exceed that because if we break through 2450 on strong earnings, in the second quarter, which was, I said, will be announced in July, there may be just a flood of money into equities from all these institutions who are underinvested in equities. So don't write off the stock market. Look for opportunities, look for ways to position your portfolios to benefit from a melt up in stocks instead of a meltdown. Now, yeah, well, you know, actually, Mark, the uh, last week was a great point. Uh, you know, you had the, what everybody thought was the start of a, rotation out of technology stocks. And it really looks like the institutions use that as a buying opportunity as the stocks pulled back, you know, because they're right back where they, they, they were uh, two weeks ago. And not only that, Nick, but there was a, a little bit of a group rotation from um, technology into financial and healthcare stocks. And we'll take a look at the healthcare sector uh, in depth in a few minutes. Uh, this chart, is part of the reason we remain bullish on the market. From the low in February of 2016 through the high in April at 2450, the market had a 25% advance based on the S&P 500. In previous rallies, and there have been 72 of them over the last, I think, 75 years of 25% or more, 50% of the time you have an additional 25% advance. Now, I don't think that's where we are because we're probably in the late stages of a bull market. But remember, bull markets don't die of old age. They die of over-enthusiasm. And we're, we're barely at the over-enthusiasm stage. Uh, it happened in the tech sector, but not broadly. 25% additionally of the time after you have a 25% rally, 12 months later, the market is up an average of 5%. I think that's where we are right now. Uh, 5% uh, from the, actually it was measured to the 2400 level. So 5% above that would be 2520. Uh, we've already achieved part of that. Uh, but there's always the possibility of a melt up. So if you're looking for a bear market based on political turmoil, valuations, or the fact that we've been in an eight year bull market that just had a, an additional 25% advance, three out of four times you're gonna be wrong because only 25% of the time are you down a year later after a 25% rally. And this was all measured to the April peak. So I hope we've made the case that you should be looking for opportunities and not uh, hiding under the bed covers uh, <laughs> because I know a lot of clients uh, are asking you whether the market's overvalued and a lot of the advisors that we talk to on a daily basis are nervous about the market. And part of this webinar is to show you how to find the opportunities and uh, convince you that stock selection and uh, sector and group uh, selection where ETFs are very easy to implement uh, is really the key to what you should be doing going forward. There is a big problem though that we all encounter, which is information overload. We experience it in our daily lives, Snapchat, LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, email, you name it, and also in terms of making investment decisions. Zeroing in on 
the important information, the important data that you need to make decisions is actually the key to effectively running your practice to have better interactions with your clients. And what we do at Chaken Analytics is cut through the clutter so that people who've embraced this whole concept of the power gauge rating, and we've got an example of that in LAM research on the left going back to March 27th, I refuse to give up this chart. On the right is the kind of fundamental data that institutional investors look at to make investment decisions. Very difficult for anybody without a uh, PhD in finance or 30 years of experience as a portfolio manager to make decisions based on those numbers. But it is possible based on the power gauge rating and when we took this screenshot for a webinar on March 27th, LAM Research was 127 with a very bullish rating, having moved up from 80. And where did it go? It went up to 165 as investment banks like Deutsche Bank kept raising their estimates. Deutsche Bank now has an estimate of 170 for LAM, which pulled back dramatically, as Nick said in last week's tech rec, uh, but is starting to regroup. So uh, cutting through the clutter is our solution to information overload. And all of the examples we're going to use in this afternoon's webinar come from Chaken Analytics for desktop and iPad. So yeah. I was just going to say, I, it absolutely is true. Even at the with the large institutional money managers, uh, they absolutely filter everything that an analyst or a portfolio manager sees. They actually aren't even allowed to look at uh, half the research reports that come across their desks. So if you look at that picture on the right, you know, you might be able to, to do an equity process if you only had eight to 15 stocks, which is what a sell side research analyst has. But if you're trying to look across the market, there's just no chance you can use, uh, you know, discounted cash flow models the way that, that an analyst might use it. So this really leads into what we do well here at Chaken and where we think we add value, uh, both the advisor and the high net worth individual level. We give investors an edge. We call it the Chaken directional edge. We do that by combining fundamentals with technicals into a quantitative model, proven itself in six and a half years, uh, as you'll see, of real-time performance, uh, been the basis for some indexes uh, with NASDAQ that have now um, been licensed for ETF. So proven technology that actually helps you sift through 5,000 US equities ETFs as well and know which ones are likely to outperform or underperform. Now we've encapsulated the Chaken methodology into a this triangle, because to be successful, you need to have a disciplined methodology. Every successful institutional money manager has one. So at the top of the pyramid, the Chaikin power gauge rating, our 20 factor quantitative model grouped into four primary factors and sector and industry group strength. At the bottom, just two technical indicators to give you a strong flavor of what institutions are doing and how stocks are performing relative to the market. And then as you'll see in some of the examples, we have six pairs of buy and sell signals to help uh, time both um, active institutional uh, managers and even passive managers uh, for longer term entry points. So two patterns that we've identified that incorporate the Chaikin power gauge rating First one is our classic bull pattern. It requires that the power gauge rating, our fundamentally driven quant model is bullish, stock is outperforming the market, and check and money flow is strong, indicating that institutions are accumulating that particular stock. Now our poster child for the last nine months has been applied materials, AMAT, they make equipment for the semiconductor industry. And as you can see on the bottom, We've got a red, green, yellow ribbon that shows you what the power gauge rating was every day, every week for the last 52 weeks, for the last year. Notice it's never been read on AMAT. Right above that is our unique way of portraying relative price performance to the S&P. 
Now you could get this from William O'Neill in terms of his relative strength as a number from one to 99, but in my view, numbers contribute to information overload. I love pictures. So we've color coded relative strength from red to green, and we'll show you a unique way of spotting changes in market psychology and sentiment toward an individual stock using relative strength. So on this chart, we have the market agreeing with the model. That's really important. No matter what fundamental approach to the market you take, the market needs to agree with you. Otherwise, at best, that stock is dead money, and at worst, it's a disaster in the making. So we give you the directional edge with the power gauge rating, and there are other quant models that are out there that are uh, you know, good, but we think not as good. But really critical to combine that one important technical indicator, relative price performance. All institutional managers are measured on relative performance. So what are they doing? the people who are running the big mutual funds or actively uh, manage ETFs, they're constantly culling weak stocks from their portfolio because it brings down their performance and therefore their compensation. Now, above that, check and money flow. In the case of AMAT, it shows you that institutions have been accumulating the stock. Normally, check and money flow fluctuates from red to green, which it did a couple of times on this chart. But notice this period from late January through this morning, even on the dips, like we just saw, money flow stayed positive. Why is that important? Because that tells you that institutions are not contributing to the decline. They're actually taking advantage of it. And part of the reason is that stocks like AMAT have had a history of positive earnings surprises. That's one of the 20 stocks, 20 factors in the check and power gauge rating. And then you also see example of our oversold buy signals, which come when a stock with a bullish rating makes an eight day low. So on this one chart is everything you need to make an informed opinion about individual stocks. And we cover 5,000 US equities and ADRs. Now the opposite- well, I, I would also Nick, add- come on in, in. Okay, sorry. It's hard to get in every now and then. <laughs> I know. But I would also say in the top right corner, you also see that the uh, it's a strong industry. So the trends have also been strong. Uh, so that, you know, again, it puts uh, the wind behind your back and it allows you to catch a little tailwind because not only is AMAT going up, but pretty much a lot of the stocks in the industries are going up. And, you know, that's, that's a big part to uh, in terms of getting good return is getting the right industries. And so that's also just a help in terms of applied material. Well, and th that's a good point because we're looking at three disciplines on one chart. The fundamentals are basically analyzed by the power gauge rating, does the heavy lifting for you. But then we've got the relative price trend, which is strong, and the industry group. So if you've got all three of these at your back, this is what Warren Buffett would call the fat pitch. Everything's lined up. Now you just have to have an attractive low risk entry point and we just got a sell off in tech stocks which gave you the ability to buy market leading stocks on significant weakness. And then of course, it's important to know when earnings are due out. So not only do we color code the earnings reports, red, gray or green to tell you whether they beat estimates or disappointed, but we also show you the next earnings date, which in the case of AMAT up here at the top is August 17th. And our earnings uh, alert indicator is green, telling you that the likelihood is there'll be a positive earnings surprise yet again. Now, the opposite end of the spectrum are classic bears. Power gauge ratings bearer stock is underperforming the market. Check and money flow is red, not green, telling you that institutions are selling the stock and Here's an example of that Under Armour, big institutional favorite up in the low 40s, power gauge rating turned bearish last July. Stock has been underperforming the market for a year. Along the way, institutions have just sold this stock every chance they could get. Even when it rallied 10, 15%, they were sellers. And it's important to note that it's never too late to sell a stock in our view that has everything lined up against it. Fundamentals, relative performance, and money flow, because 
down from 42 to 30, there were a lot of people on CNBC saying, well, it might be time to step into Under Armour. They've got these nice contracts with athletes, so they're competing with Nike. Well, it turned out to be a, a disaster of a stock. So selling it at 30 uh, down from 42 was a good idea because the stock bottomed out at 18. And it's really making no upside progress. These gaps are in relation to negative earnings surprises. Notice these two relative strength sell signals right before a negative earnings surprise. So that's what a discipline methodology can do for you and for your clients, help you avoid stocks or at least have a, a rich conversation with them about a stock they own uh, where you might want them to exit and have some really a sound fundamental basis uh, for talking to them about it. Yeah. Now, and during, been, that, and during, go that, ahead, Nick. during that year when uh, Under Armour was dropping in half or more than half, uh, the market was rallying by about 20%. So as bad as that chart looks, it actually was much, much worse because people were storing their money in a stock where they could have been putting it in a stock that was going to grow at 20%. And not only that, a lot of the other apparel stocks like Lululemon and Ralph Lauren were going down and we're going to see a persistent group weakness uh, in the auto parts uh, sector to end the webinar. So group trends persist. And if you uh, spot it in one stock in a group, uh, you can very quickly and check and see what the other stocks in that industry group are doing. And very often you'll see a pattern of stocks uh, that, that basically trade together because they're influenced by the similar factors. Now, we've referred to the Chaikin power gauge rating. We output it as a simple gauge. Looks like the gas gauge on your car goes from very bearish to very bullish, but don't confuse simple with simplistic because under the surface, there's some powerful um, number crunching going on. And it can also be your GPS during earnings season. A stock with the bullish power gauge rating is twice as likely to have a positive earnings surprise, whereas a stock with a bearish power gauge rating is twice as likely to have a negative earnings surprise. So a lot of uh, people are reluctant to make decisions on stocks during earnings season. We think that's a mistake. And although we don't cover it in this webinar, there are great opportunities, as you saw with Under Armour, if you have the right tools, the right information quickly uh, at your disposal to do some really good things for you and your clients, either with options or by taking a defensive posture. When you have a high probability that something negative is going to happen, you can position yourself ahead of that. So there's a lot more going on than meets the eye in the Chaikin power gauge rating. And one of our biggest fans and a partner is John Carter, who takes a shorter term approach to the market. He's one of the best traders I know. And he saw the Chaikin power gauge and called it an objective awesome meter for stocks. What he liked was that it incorporated 20 fundamental and technical factors to anticipate a stock's potential. And this is high praise from someone I consider to be one of the top um, traders in America, trades futures, options, stocks, um, and, and uses tools that are highly regarded and has embraced the Chaikin power gauge for over a year. Now, what are these four primary factors and, and the 20 uh, sub factors that go into them? Well, we look at financials, earnings, technicals, and expert opinions. And within them, we've got five sub factors in each. And hearkening back to our first slide, these are the factors that successful institutional investors look at every day. This is what Nick and I learned from our mentors as we were selling fundamental data, or in my case, technical approach to the market. We had to learn what our clients were looking at, what the big successful institutional investors were looking at. And they look at some subset of these factors. Nick, you may want to speak to uh, your yeah. experience working with institutional investors and some of the factors that are in the power gauge. Yeah, I mean, it's it's all in there. That's uh, it's absolutely true. Um, and one of the things, you know, these we put a factor up there and we put twenty factors up there, but what you don't see 
is how much care goes into calculating each of these factors. A good example is when I got here, I was basically talking to Mark how institutional money managers had been somewhat discounting earnings surprise because it was easy for companies to manufacture just by leaking out to the analysts that their earnings might be a little low, analysts would bring down their estimates and then lo and behold, earnings would be released and it would beat surprise. Uh, you know, Mark turned to me with a sort of, a, a, you know, glint in his eye and basically said, you don't think we thought of that? And, uh, you know, they have a, a look ahead of five quarters on their earnings surprise factor. So even though these factors look fairly simplistic, or not simplistic, but they, they look fairly, uh, you know, standard on the face of it, each one of these has been tuned to be absolutely relevant in the way that an institutional money manager would look at, at uh, uh, this data. Um, so things like projected PE ratio and so forth is exactly what's being used out there in the marketplace. And this really uh, keys into the three important themes that guide uh, strategists at uh, the big investment banks and uh, investment decision makers, value, growth, and sentiment. And we capture all of that with some technicals thrown in. So. Uh, we consider what we do quantitatively driven, and those are the four key elements of um, multi-factor quantitative models. So we've done this in a very uh, powerful way so that uh, in any given market cycle, the power gauge can like value and or grow stocks, but if there really is um, a tilt toward value, the model will pick it up. It's very robust. It's strong uh, in terms of finding both winners and losers and potential um, landmines that can blow up a portfolio. So uh, a couple of proof points. In 2016, using the Russell 3000 as a universe, the average very bullish stock, and these are equally populated silos, that question often comes up, was up 32%. And the average very bearish stock was up only 9.5%. Now that's a pretty wide spread, and that's really what's significant about the power gauge rating. Its ability to differentiate between stocks that are likely to underperform and stocks that are likely to outperform. Yeah, and uh, you know, every single portfolio manager goes through this process of rating their uh, their performance and where it's coming from, and, and breaking things into quintiles and so forth. Um, What's notable about uh, the power gauge rating is it's just been so consistent year in, year out. Uh, Mark, I think your next slide, Mark, if you go to it, talks about the downside. So even in a rough year like 2015, the, the rating you know, shows that same outperformance in the uh, very bullish stocks. It's, uh, and, and that's not normal. This is, this is something that's, that's really unique in the marketplace. And more importantly, uh, the power gauge rating would have helped you avoid the collapse in energy stocks and MLPs because the power gauge rating uh, was bearish on key energy stocks, some of them as early as January of 14 in terms of the offshore drilling uh, stocks like Diamond Offshore and uh, and Transocean, and then certainly beginning in August of 14 on the fracking stocks and then stocks like Schlumberger and so forth. So uh, what contributed to the underperformance of the very bare stocks in 2015 was the energy complex, small caps in general, and uh, companies like the rails who were tied to the energy uh, sector moving liquids around. So very important to know the difference between stocks that have the ability to outperform and underperform. One final proof point, we've got a partnership with NASDAQ. Three years ago, we uh, created three NASDAQ Chaikin uh, power indexes based on their large cap, small cap, and dividend achiever index. The goal was to find the best of the best using the Chaikin power gauge rating as the final piece of a rules-based top-down methodology. Uh, one proviso though, NASDAQ rebalances their indexes once a year, so we could only change the NASDAQ Chaikin indexes once a year. So they're really buy and hold portfolios with the power gauge rating bullish in order for a stock to get into the portfolio. Now, we had hoped to develop a solid three-year track record, which we did, and then have um, an ETF creator license these indexes. And uh, that happened in the, um, uh, in this 
beginning of 2017 when uh, New York Life's mainstay investment subsidiary and their index IQ subsidiary licensed all three NASDAQ Chaikin indexes, registered them with the SEC, and then just about uh, a little less than a month ago um, launched uh, the Chaikin, the index IQ Chaikin uh, small cap ETF. This is not meant to be a recommendation to buy that ETF, just a validation of the intellectual property that we're going to be walking you through for the balance of the webinar. Now, uh, the, what attracted Index IQ and New York Life, which is the largest uh, mutual insurance company in America with a very large investment management subsidiary, was the outperformance of all three of these indexes over a three-year period. The small cap index outperformed the Russell 2000 by over 2,000 basis points over three years. And that's the underlying index for the CSML, the Chaikin uh, Small Cap Exchange Traded Fund, which is um, uh, starting to pick up some volume now and some assets under management, over 75 million in assets under management in less than a month. So uh, the market is taking notice. And again, not meant to be a recommendation to buy it, just meant to be validation for the intellectual property. Now, I, I spoke earlier about the importance of knowing when a stock had changed character, uh, and we call this a personality change, but I know Nick wants to add something here. <laughs> no, I was just going to say that, uh, you know, it, it really is amazing to see that it the small cap is almost double the performance of the underlying benchmark, and the same's almost true of the uh, dividend index. So uh, just uh, in terms of... Uh, personality changes, this has been one of the keys to selecting stocks and really avoiding mistakes and also getting into a stock just as it's uh, beginning its run. So I'll turn it back to Mark on this. Well, it, it's really important uh, because too often in Wall Street, we put our feet in cement, meaning that we fall in love with a stock or we love to hate a stock. So here's uh, an example of a bullish personality change in November in Anthem Healthcare. Anthem had been underperforming the market after a strong run in 2015 into early 16. And then after the Trump victory, uh, it changed character. It broke out of this basing formation and it started to outperform the market with very heavy institutional accumulation. So in spite of all the uncertainties about the repeal and replace of the Affordable Care Act, and what impact that might have on healthcare providers, Anthem Health had a bullish personality change which was accompanied by a bullish fundamentally oriented power gauge rating. So you had all three of our key metrics lining up. And along the way, there were some wonderful buying opportunities in Anthem. And we had a new high early in the day today, new all-time high in Anthem. So it shows you how important it is to know when stocks are changing character. Now, on the downside, a bearish personality change is a gift from the gods because it enables you to start leaking out of stocks that are potentially going to blow up. And here's another example of the fact that it's never too early to too late to sell a stock where things are lined up again. So Hertz um, dropped from 50 all the way to um, 30 with a negative earnings surprise dropped down to 25, but it was still appropriate to sell that stock because it hasn't bottomed out yet and it's trading under 10, it's $9. So well-known name, a big obviously player in the rental car business. Uh, that business is undergoing some major changes, could be because of Uber, could be because used car prices are dropping. But whatever the reason, the power gauge rating picked up on that. And remember, we monitor analysts and what they're doing and saying, changing their estimates, changing their opinions, as well as earning surprises. So the more sensitive factors in the model have obviously picked up on analyst negativity in stocks like Hertz. And you're seeing a big um, underperformance with continued institutional selling. Now, here's the meat of the presentation for those of you who use sectors and ETFs to allocate client assets. And we call this a top-down approach. Looking at our power bars for the 10 select spider sector ETFs, drilling down on strong and weak sectors, 
to find the stocks with the best potential and also the ETFs with the best potential. So Nick, I'm going to uh, sort of turn it over to you because this is something that you really love about Chaikin. And why don't you, you know, take it from the top? Sure. Well, before I even get started, uh, you know, if you talk to institutional money managers, and I, I just uh, recall a conversation I had with the quant analyst at Federated Investors, uh, basically saying that if you get the sectors right in your portfolio, uh, that is 66% of your work. Um, it will uh, almost guarantee that you get positive overachievement um, because getting the sectors right is really how it's done. Um, so, you know, as you can see from this, uh, you know, you get the, the tailwinds, you get long profits, uh, and weak sectors are continually gonna be uh, troublesome. You might find a gem or two, but in general, you're really skewing the odds against you if you're in, in the wrong sectors. So picking the right sectors, getting the right tailwinds behind you is really, really critical. Um, and how do you do that? Well. We help you. Um, so in the ETF section of our product, we break down all the spider sectors and we provide you with what uh, are what we call the power bar. And that's this uh, green, orange, red bar that goes across. Um, and in that, you can see how many stocks are rated bullish or very bullish, how many are neutral and how many are um, bearish or very bearish. So the more obviously that you're in the uh, bullish category relative to the bearish category, uh, the better you get. So you can see there are a few sectors that really stand out um, in, in this picture. And, you know, I, I'm going to leave utilities off to the side. But, you know, if you look at financials, healthcare, and technology, all three of these sectors really have some room to run. Uh, you know, Mark and I continually think that financials have uh, some some really good tailwinds with uh, the Fed increasing rates, regulation going down a little bit. Same thing with healthcare, believe it or not. Even with the uh, with the trend in uh, or the the uh, government regulate or government rules changing, uh, healthcare is, just has so much going on for it because the aging population uh, it it's got years to run. So. Uh, and, you know, to, to look at the opposite, you know, look at energy. You can't find a good stock in the energy uh, uh, ETF right now. So, uh, you know, that just goes to show how important it is. If you're in the right sector, you know, it is not hard to pick the right stocks. Um, and so, again, you know, you look at industries, technology, healthcare, and no surprise, those three have been the leaders for the last three months. And again, you know, it, I always think the power bar is forward looking, the three months is uh, tail looking. Uh, so in the mirror, three months is in the tail mirror and looking out forward, you've got the power bar looking out into the future. Um, so I would say that, you know, all three sort of have uh, you know, they, they've had a good run and they'll continue to have a good run. And again, <laughs> there's energy. Mark's the one uh, uh, working the pen right now. So uh, you can say, uh, you know, energy is just really in trouble. And, you know, it's, the, it's energy prices is really, really hurting them. So yeah, I, I get the opportunity, which I can't do because I can't walk and chew gum at the same time when I'm just doing the webinar by myself to sort of try out the tools here, of the, <laughs> the platform we use. But we are going to cover um, healthcare and technology and then take a deep look at energy. And uh, again, we were quoted today on being amazed at how uh, the market was able to make new highs with energy making new 52 week lows. So uh, why don't we take a look at the um, technology sector. Again, this is a one-year chart. Now, notice at the bottom, we don't have a power gauge rating for ETFs yet, but I'm happy to announce that the, the most difficult piece of our uh, ETF ratings, power gauge ratings for ETF, uh, was wrapped up 
this weekend by our research team, and we expect within the next couple of months to introduce power gauge ratings based on fundamentals and technicals for those um, ETFs that have individual stock components and just purely the technicals for things like bonds and gold and silver and the uh, country funds uh, where we don't have power gauge ratings for foreign equities. So very excited about that. But even before we introduce the power gauge rating, as Nick said, the power bars, which tell you the number of bullish versus bearish stocks in the power gauge rating system within an ETF have been very, very helpful uh, at pointing investors uh, and asset allocators toward the right sectors. So here we see the technology ETF. It's been outperforming the market since January. It was outperforming prior to the election and then uh, profit taking set in as companies that were more likely to benefit from the Trump agenda like the industrials and the material stocks rallied. Uh, money came out of tech uh, and flowed into those sectors. So there's always sector rotation and group rotation going on. But notice the take in money flow. That's your tip off of what the institutions are doing. They bought heavily in the first phase of this advance and then they've been buying again, including and uh, up till uh, the uh, tech sell off that we saw last week. So we've already looked at AMAT, Applied Materials. Here's another stock in the semiconductor group as part of the tech sector, LAM Research, symbol LRCX, has had 18 quarters in a row of positive earnings surprises. So in response to Nick's query about, uh, you know, aren't companies and analysts sort of gaming the system by lowering expectations and then beating estimates, you don't produce 18 quarters in a row of positive earnings surprises and go from $20 to 165 uh, through um, tricks and mirrors. Here's a serious technology provider uh, equipment for semiconductor manufacturers, strong power gauge rating, outperforming the market, fabulous check in money flow, history of earnings surprises, another oversold buy signal here just uh, three days ago when the tech stocks sold off. So a perfect example of our classic bull and the way you can take advantage of knowing what sectors to look for to find individual stocks if you're so inclined for client portfolios. Yeah, and Mark, there were some earlier questions about valuations. You know, our company valuations getting so high, it's impossible to uh, increase them. What's interesting about LAM research as well as applied material is if you had looked at them two years ago, you would have said their valuations were very high, but their earnings have increased so quickly over the last two, two years that now their PEs have come into line and actually look kind of reasonable, which for a stock that's growing as fast as these two is pretty impressive. Well, that's an interesting point, Nick, and it actually leads to a question that often comes up and we see it in the press more than we see it from our advisor clients, because I think you're a little more sophisticated than that. But people are comparing what's going on in tech today to what happened in 2000. Well, the big difference is in 2000, most of the high flying tech stocks had no earnings. Right. Right now, you're looking at a tech sector particularly in semiconductors, uh, but also in some of the other big tech names like Apple and Microsoft that have very solid earnings, earnings growth and earnings surprises. So it's a t in my view, it's a totally different market. Yeah. Uh, can valuations get stretched? Of course they can. They're a little bit stretched in the utility stocks, which are slow growing stocks, but have good dividends. So as interest rates have dropped back down, utilities have become uh, strong again, but in tech, uh, sure, the valuations are stretched and you, you, you're you sensitive to a research report like we got out of Goldman Sachs last week saying that tech stocks were rich on a valuation basis. Well, in 50 years on Wall Street, I've never seen a bear market in stocks or individual sectors just based purely on valuation. Can they get overbought and be vulnerable to a correction? Of course, that's what we just saw. And we saw it in biotech in 2015. But biotech, as we'll see in a minute, has come roaring back and is making new highs. So uh, be very wary of the headlines and the people on CNBC who are trying to make a name for themselves by going out on a big limb, knowing that people will forget very quickly if they're wrong. So tech is strong. 
but so is healthcare. And here we're looking at the XLV, which is the Select Spider Sector Healthcare ETF. These are the large cap healthcare stocks in the S&P 500. And the XLV just started out performing about two months ago, but healthcare is a broad category. And one of the groups within the healthcare sector is near and dear to Nick's heart, and that's the biotech group. So Nick, why don't you um, sort of get into your analysis of the whole biotech industry group complex using ETFs as the example? Great. Well, so, so the interesting thing about uh, biotech ETFs is there, there's probably about 12 ETFs that are out there, and they're so constructed differently uh, that you really almost, if you're going to pick a, a, an ETF to put in your portfolio, you almost have to treat it as a stock and really understand what, the, what makes it up and what drives the valuation on it. So that by the time you select the biotech ETF, you're selecting the right one for you know, whatever you're trying to accomplish in that portfolio. But as Mark said, the biotech ETFs are beginning to take off. You can see this is the S&P bio tech ETF. And it's really had a very nice run over the last couple, uh, couple weeks. It's had a lot of money flow coming into it. Uh, you can see it had a personality change where Mark has uh, circled in yellow uh, the relative strength. So, so this is a company that has, or this is an ETF that's beginning to show some signs of uh, a runway. And this is after a couple years. Uh, and, you know, just to highlight the point, this table here shows you how different the ETF landscape is for some of these ETFs. And, you know, there's not a huge number, so it's fun to sort of go through, analyze each ETF. But the range in betas, for instance, which is a measurement of uh, risk or price volatility relative to market price volatility, um, you know, it's interesting. If on the low side, You've got a beta of 1.36, so there's an ETF that has a beta of 1.36. On the high side, it's over six. That's a triple leveraged ETF. So again, you know, obviously the the ETF with a beta of six is not for everybody. This is a highly risky, highly leveraged ETF. So you have to know what you're getting into. Additionally, the cost varies dramatically. Some of them are very reasonable in terms of basis points, the, you know, so the, at the low end, it's 34 basis points. Others are beginning to get into mutual fund territory in the 94 basis points. So there is an efficiency here in terms of what you can find in the ETFs. Uh, the other thing that, yeah, you really do need to watch as you're beginning to delve into these smaller industry or niche ETFs is the size of the ETF, because you want to be able to get into and out of the ETF at the appropriate amount of time. And if you've got an ETF, for example, that's at 28 million and doesn't trade a whole bunch, when you wanna sell it, you may not have a willing buyer on the other side. So understanding the size and liquidity uh, is really, really important. The other thing that size does is it provides a foundation so that people are gonna, you, you've gotta have faith that somebody on the other end there that's doing the investing for the ETF, uh, if you've got 3.3 billion in there, then you know that somebody's really looking at it and, and keeping good track of it. Oops. And finally, uh, the number of, hold oh, that's all right, uh, just number of holdings. For me, a biotech is all about getting the right uh, companies, you know, you're, 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 rather than placing a bet on a single company in a biotech, and hoping that they get uh, FDA approval and all of the necessary things. Uh, what I'm looking for is a relatively widespread for that ETF so that I can take advantage of you know, multiple companies that, that succeed. And there's gonna be multiple, multiple companies that fail. So I don't wanna have all my eggs in one basket. And so you can see the more holdings versus the less holdings. If you're going into the smaller, more concentrated holdings, you're really beginning to focus on particular companies within that ETF, and you'd better know what's in there. Uh, Nick, we're about an hour in, so I think we need to pick up the pace here so that we don't keep people too long in the middle okay. of the workday. So uh, let's start zipping through some of the slides here. Uh, great. So you just can see that uh, you know there's a widespread in terms of uh, performance. 
and we can go on to the next slide. Here's, a, here's an interesting one. So of the ones that we looked at, XBI had a very strong performance outside of the uh, leveraged one, and it has a just a good array of holdings. So it, it's not overly concentrated. And then you can take a look down in the bottom panel, you can see what the beta is. So it's got a reasonable risk profile. You can see it's got $3.3 billion worth of assets. And more importantly, it changes hand, uh, 4.1 million shares change hand every day. So a lot of liquidity, a lot of uh, assets, and um, it's also got a 0.34 or 34 basis point cost to it. So overwhelmingly good looking ETF, I would say. And on a, the other a, hand, a key point here is this is a lot of the same information you would have to go to a site like ETF.com or Morningstar to get. We incorporate it all into Chaken Analytics. So one sort of information source for everything you need to know about stocks and ETFs. So why don't we take a look at an alternative to the um, S&P uh, ETF, which is the iShares NASDAQ Biotech, the IBB, which is also very popular, but has been underperforming the market instead of outperforming the market. Uh, also spiking up to a new high, but after a significant period of underperformance. And uh, Nick, why don't you contrast the difference between what we saw in the uh, Select Spider Biotech ETF in terms of holding breakdown with what we're looking at here in the IBB? So the IBB is almost the exact opposite. Well, not exact, but it's also a very large uh, ETF. It's in the 8 billion range. So again, another very large one, but it is market cap weighted and it basically concentrates the holdings then on some names that you already know. So uh, if you look at the top three holdings, that's gonna be almost 23% of the entire portfolio. The top seven holdings are gonna be around 50%. So unlike the other ETF, we're now making very concentrated bets, which means that you've got to really peer under the covers and look at the individual stocks. At the same time, you know, decent expense ratio, decent beta, you know, so everything else is fine. But what you're really looking at is the holdings itself are very much concentrated into five to seven holdings. Yeah, I think that's absolutely critical. It's it's also important in the S&P, the Spider ETF, which a lot of people use for broad market exposure. 40% uh, of the gain this year in the um, SPY and the S&P 500 index is accounted for by those six stocks that we mentioned earlier. So if you think you're getting broad exposure to large cap equities by buying the SPY, you're getting broad exposure to f six companies with the other uh, 494 thrown in. So very important, as Nick says, to look under the hood to see what you're getting. So we talked about uh, the need to identify the losers. We call that playing good defense. And now we're going to zero in on the energy ETF as an example. Uh, but first, a question or an answer to a question that we get all the time. Well, Chaykin and help me in a bear market. And the answer is yes, this is an idealized view of how stocks go down, uh, developed by Richard Wyckoff over 90 years ago. And the charts we've been looking at and the ones we're gonna see here in the energy complex actually mirror this idealized view. And the reason is human nature hasn't changed and stock prices to a great extent are a mirror of fear and greed, you know, the ultimate in uh, polar opposites in human emotions. So here's the XLE, the Select Spider Sector ETF, but this is a five-year chart. And we see that there was a bear market in the XLE. It dropped from 100 down to 50 between the peak in Ju July of 14 and the trough in early 16. So uh, how did Chaykin help in a bear market in energy stocks? Well, first of all, you had a bearish personality change right near the top. Uh, that stayed negative in terms of relative strength for that whole decline. And then you had a stock like Kinder Morgan where we had a power gauge rating that a lot of um, uh, advisors were drawn to because of the high dividend yield, uh, which stayed up for an extra, I'd say six months after the energy complex broke down because they were rolling up MLPs into the parent company. But uh, that had a decline of more than 50% when it finally had its personality change here and a bearish power gauge rating, it dropped from 
about 42 all the way down to $10. So a decline of over 75%. And the Chaikin power gauge methodology combined with relative strength helped you identify that. Now, here's what a chart of Kinder Morgan looked like on a one-year chart on the way down. This comes from our portable iPad app. And this chart ends in um, early 2016. And it shows you that the power gauge rating on Kinder Morgan turned bearish. You had a negative personality change in the $40 range. Institutions were selling it. And again, that example of it's never too late to sell a stock where everything's lined up against it. Overbought sell signals, new eight-day highs on a stock with a bearish power gauge rating above $30 on the way down to 10 ultimately. Very powerful, compelling tools to help you stay on the right side of the market. Now, what's energy doing today? Well, we saw in the power bar zero stocks with bullish power gauge ratings, over 22 with bearish ratings. And energy is in its own bear market now. That's what they were talking about in this Reuters article today where we were quoted. We had a bearish personality change here in January. The XLE was 74. And it's now trading at around 64. So it's down 15%, again, with the market making new all-time highs. So you want to have been avoiding energy stocks like Schlumberger. And we had a sell signal ahead of the latest earnings report. And this is about two months after the sector turned bearish. The stock was trending down, but that downtrend was accelerated with a negative earnings surprise. And here's Schlumberger today making new 52-week lows. Bottom fishing in energy stocks in 2015 and 16 was a really um, bad idea. And bottom fishing now in energy stocks, in my opinion, is a, bear, a bad idea. I've been quoted as saying that bottom fishing is the most expensive sport in America. And the energy complex, both in 14, 15, and 16, and now again in 2017, is a perfect example of that. Now, here's another example of a key stock in the oil machinery services and drilling sector, Helmerich and Payne. Sell signal before a negative earnings report. The stock was around 68 on its way to 50. You want to avoid sectors like energy when everything is screaming negative and you want to avoid the key stocks in the energy sector. If you own them, and clients won't sell them or you're uncomfortable because of tax considerations, sell options, generate income, buy some protection. A lot of ways that you can take advantage of the knowledge that is embedded in these three key indicators, power gauge, relative strength, and money flow. So I'd like to end the webinar by looking at an industry group that we zeroed in on in April, which was the auto parts retailers. Bearish power bars, earnings reports due out, and in our weekly market insights on April 9th, I said, here are three bearish auto parts retailers to sell on strength, Advanced Auto Parts, AutoZone, and O'Reilly. And the reason I said sell them on strength is because they had just dipped to new 52-week lows. But look at this wonderful opportunity when the stock, in this case, AutoZone rallied from 680 up to 710 to sell it on strength dip all the way to 570 after a bearish earnings surprise. So 710 to 570, that's a lot of damage to a sidestep. And yet again, you had a rally up to the 618 area, and now you're making new lows at 583. Same thing happened to O'Reilly Auto. Here's where we put out that sell on strength. You had one opportunity ahead of a negative earnings surprise, and then you had two more opportunities. It's amazing how short covering and wishful thinking will create selling opportunities, and here again, a new 52-week low. So group strength tends to be homogeneous, meaning, as we saw with Under Armour, when the apparel stocks get weak, they all get weak. When the retailers get weak, they all get weak. Same thing was true for the auto parts. And then finally, advanced auto parts, very similar pattern, sell signal ahead of a negative earnings surprise that had been the case the previous quarter, new 52-week lows today. A bearish personality change preceded the bulk of the damage. It came with the stock at about 155 on the way to 125. So group strength and sector strength persists, as Nick said, to start this segment. 
and we give you the tools to spot all this. So Chaikin Analytics, which is what we've been using to illustrate these discipline content, uh, concepts, bottom-up stock picking and top-down um, sector and industry group construction, portfolio allocation, comes with our new stock discovery engine, which we didn't have the time to get into, which helps you find stock ideas based on the way Pandora and Spotify find you music and Netflix finds you movies, very contemporary, very powerful. Comes with options play, screener, earnings alerts, news and our intraday charts. It's really a complete information package with one big differentiator. It's got a proven alpha generating model built into it. And that's really the differentiator. So John Walden, who many of you know, has a big following in the advisor community, he has a, two free market letters that are read by over 500,000 people every week. A lot of advisors believe in what John's doing, is also a partner of Oz, and he's instructed his team after a one-year due diligence to use Chaikin Analytics to vet their recommendations. They're actually using it very aggressively in their product called the Rational Bear, and they've used um, our power gauge rating and our charts on Avis, symbol CAR, and on Bank Santander, which has a big exposure to auto loans, to make some very profitable recommendations for their clients in their Rational Bear newsletter. So John has given us the ultimate compliment. He runs his own investment conference, which just ended, uh, gets some of the best speakers in the world there, quoted in Barron's CNBC all the time, another validation of the intellectual property that we've been showing you today. So Chaikin Analytics for iPad and desktop normally sells for $1,950 a year for an annual subscription. As a webinar special, and we appreciate the fact that so many people have stayed on with us, we'd like to reduce the price $200, bringing it down to $1,750. This offer expires on Friday, June 23rd, and you can go to chickenanalytics.com slash profits for our whole uh, sales and support team are standing by. You can call them at the number on the screen if you have any questions about the presentation or about the subscription. Now, along with what we've been showing you, you get small group tutorials three times a week to help you learn what's in Chaikin Analytics and get started in a way that makes you more productive in your practice. We also have my weekly market insights, and we showed you an example of that in the auto parts stock where I analyze the market and group and sector trends plus individual stock recommendations. And then my colleague, John Schlitz's daily morning insights, which comes into your inbox around nine o'clock and means that you don't have to stay glued to CNBC in order to know what's happening in the pre uh, markets and then the world markets overnight. And all that is a complete package. And as a special webinar inducement for you to um, leverage the time you spent with us, if you subscribe by midnight tonight, we'll take an additional $100 off the cost of Chaikin Analytics, reducing it to $1,650. And as an added inducement, sort of uh, impromptu, for the first seven people who subscribe by midnight tonight, you'll get a one-on-one -on -one phone call with either myself or Nick Webb, where we can sort of learn about what you do and how Chaikin Analytics can help you do it better. So chaikinanalytics.com slash profits. I know at this point, Joe Bacelli usually is typing that link into the chat box, so you can click on it. And uh, Joe, with that, I'm gonna turn it over to you. I'd like to thank my colleague, Nick Webb. This is the first time we've done a webinar together. I I'm really think it was a dynamic interaction and it's only gonna get better, so look for us down the road. Thanks, Mark. Really did appreciate uh, spending some time on this. All right, great, guys. Well, thank you all very much for joining us this afternoon. Again, to reiterate Mark's offer, 1650 for a full year to check in analytics. Uh, we are available throughout this week uh, for our support webinars. Uh, probably what would be best would be to have you join us for uh, one of our onboard sessions. This is great for new subscribers. We're going to show you a lot of details about how to import different lists. I'm sure you have a number of different client portfolios that you would love to analyze using the program. Uh, we're going to walk you through that entire pro process as well as 
show you a lot of reporting functionality that will help you with that dialogue with your clients as well as some things that'll help you for regulatory purposes. Um, so we'd love to have you join us. That'll be tomorrow at two o'clock Eastern time, but really one of the best things to do in the meantime is to take, take advantage of Mark and Nick's offer, 1650 to Chaken Analytics. Again, you can reach us at 877-978-6257. In the meantime, have a great afternoon and we will see you tomorrow.